The claim, or more accurately, the boast, is that everything is bigger in Texas. In a new book from Pulitzer Prize winning author Lawrence Wright, it becomes clear that that's not just about cowboy hats and oil rigs. In the heart of Trump country, it is part and parcel of a history, culture, and way of life that for many who've never been there can be baffling. The book is called God Save Texas, a journey into the soul of the Lone Star State, and it brings the pride of Austin, Texas, Lawrence Wright, to our studio tonight. It's great to meet you. It's my pleasure, I've Steve. read so much of your stuff over the years. It's really delightful to have you here on something that is really a bit of a departure for you, if I can put it that way. And I'm going to start with just an excerpt of the book, and then we'll get off sure. to the races. I've lived in Texas most of my life, and I've come to appreciate what the state symbolizes, both to people who live here and to those who view it from afar. Texans see themselves as confident, hardworking, and neurosis-free, a distillation of the best qualities of America. Outsiders view Texas as the national id, a place where rambunctiousness and disavowed impulses run wild. Indeed, it's an irony that the figure who most embodies the values people associate with the state is a narcissistic Manhattan billionaire now sitting in the Oval Office. Yeah. Well written. You are the guy who writes for The New Yorker about international terrorism and yeah. the like. So what are you doing writing a book about Texas? Well, it was my editor at The New Yorker, David Remnick, who called me into his office and he said he wanted me to explain Texas. And, uh, and I reminded him I got paid by the word. And this is a big <laughs> question you just asked me. But uh, a lot of my colleagues are puzzled by the fact that I live in Texas because my life is in New York or Los Angeles, Washington often, abroad, but not Texas. But I live there. And um, you've been there for a long time. I've been there. I, you know, I grew up in Texas and then I fled and thought I would never go back. But um, 1979, you know, the 10th anniversary of the moon landing, I was writing for Look magazine, if you remember yeah, that. Sure. And uh, I was writing about the 12 men who walked on the moon. And one of them, Charlie Duke, was then walking on a little central Texas town called New Braunfels. And uh, that evening, uh, I wound up in a dance hall uh, in central Texas, a little German town called Green, G-R-E-U-E-N-E. -E. And uh, Asleep at the Wheel was playing this great band, and a young man named George Strait was opening. And the accents, the food, the dancing, it all just felt familiar and uh, beckoning. Why did you stay, though? I, I called my wife and I said, something's going on in Texas. And then, you know, coincidentally, a month later, I got a call from the editor of Texas Monthly. And by the end of the conversation, I was moving home. Now, mind you, you live in Austin, Texas, which yeah. is a little patch of blue in an otherwise very red state. Yeah. So does that make living there a little more palatable? I love Austin. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably the most liberal city in the entire southern tier of the United States. And, but all the cities in Texas are blue. People don't uh, realize that about the state. Uh, the, the urban areas, even Fort Worth, which is often counted red, this metropolitan area is, uh, is blue. Um, it, the cities are much alike. Uh, what's different are the suburbs. You know, the suburbs are where the redness really sets in. But the cities have, you know, preponderantly minorities. Uh, they're, um, you know, far more progressive than the rest of the state, and the, and the people of Texas are far more progressive than their elected representatives. Bit of an odd question here, but would you consider yourself a self-hating Texan? I did at one time. I remember the first time I heard my voice early on before tape recorders became so common, but I was in language lab, and I heard myself speaking Spanish. And I sounded like LBJ ordering a plate of tamales. You know, I was talking through my nose, and I, I just really sounded hicky. And I was, you know, and there were, also I came from Dallas. Um, it was, you know, shortly after the Kennedy assassination, uh, there was a tremendous stigma for anybody being from Texas, but especially from Dallas. And uh, the kind of right-wing politics that were so embraced by that city at that time, uh, didn't represent who I felt I was. And so I fled and never really intended to come back. I told you before we went on that uh, I visited Texas, I guess it was about well, four and a half years ago for the uh, 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, yeah. November 22nd, 1963. And I'm going to apologize in advance. 
But when I think of Dallas, I still think of a city of hate. Yeah. Which it was back in the day. Yeah. Am I wrong to, to, to have that still in my head? Yeah, you're wrong about that. Uh, I was there, you know, you remember the police killings in July? Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, it was striking to me the dignity uh, that the city uh, in, and intolerance of, you know, I, that event that you're talking about, the 50th anniversary, the mayor had asked me to come make a talk. And, uh, and I said uh, at the time that if Kennedy had to die anywhere, I'm glad he died in Dallas. Actually, Lawrence, let me get, let's get the quote here. Dallas is a far better city, you wrote, because Kennedy died there. Yeah. How so? Well, Dallas, uh, when Kennedy was killed there, you know, he, Dallas was taken down like no other city in America's history. Mm -hmm. And it, because of its right-wing hateful politics, and yet it was not a right-winger who killed Kennedy. It was a, mm -hmm. a socialist. I didn't know we had any in Dallas. I didn't, I didn't think I knew any Democrats. But, uh, you know, he, he was not at all representative of Dallas, but the city was humiliated. And it's possible for some people uh, to go through the process of humiliation and achieve humility. There are similar words, but they're so different in meaning. I don't think of the words Dallas and humility in the same sentence. They're still ambitious. But, uh, the, uh, but there is a certain humility that becomes a city. And I think, you know, it was, uh, you know, it had a black police chief, has a very open, progressive, tolerant attitude towards newcomers. Uh, its politics are totally different from the city I grew up in. And to me, one of the great ironies is I see much of America turning into the country, the country that the country is turning into what Dallas was in 1963. Mm. More of that kind of militarism, anti-immigrant, uh, repressive politics that was so characteristic of Dallas in 1963 that are not now, but are, it's like it's totally turned around. You do say in the book, I think Texas has nurtured an immature political culture that has done terrible damage to the state and to the nation. Yeah. For example. Redistricting would be a good example. Uh, when, the, when Republicans finally captured the Texas House of Representatives, you know, bear in mind when I was young, Texas was blue. And Democrat, just for Canadians who don't follow oh, these references. Oh, sorry, okay, yeah. yeah. the blue state means Democrat, Democrat, red state means Republican. And, right. And back in the day when Lyndon Johnson was president, for example, we're going back almost 60 years now, yeah. uh, it was blue. And California was red and yeah. produced Ronald Reagan and the modern uh, Republican right. revolution. So, <laughs> you know, these two states revolve around each other. Um, and I think uh, when Republicans finally captured the Texas State House, um, the redistricting was gerrymandered in such a way that most of the districts, both the congressional districts and the House and Senate races inside Texas, were created to be invulnerable. And like, you know, Austin, you know, very liberal city, uh, had one congressional district that uh, Lyndon Johnson used to represent, carved into six districts now and five Republicans and one Democrat represent Austin. Uh, this is a gerrymandering that went on. They became a model for other states, especially southern and western states, who would send people to Texas to see how it was done. And again, for those who don't know, gerrymandering is when you you really jury rig those boundaries of a district. This in doesn't happen in Canada? We, we have judges make the writings here. Yeah. So it's all pretty kosher. That's you, guys, you guys are so corrupt the way you do it I, down there. It, it's horrible, I yeah. agree. And it's the source of all your, uh, so much of your problems. If, you know, the Supreme Court is now hearing a lot of these gerrymandering cases, so it's my hope that there will be some judicial intervention and save some of our politics from the kind of, uh, you know, the intolerant atmosphere, the highly partisan nature of it. Hmm. Lyndon Johnson, George W. Bush, Maybe his father, George H.W. Bush, yeah. although he's not from Texas, but, you know, he yeah. went there. Tom DeLay, Tom Cruise, Ann Richards, you have larger-than-life politicians come out of Texas. Yeah. How come? Oh, we do like our characters. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I treasure that, too. Of course, as a reporter, there's nothing you like more than a colorful character, and we have, uh, we've had more than our share. 
I, I, it's not held against a person in Texas to have this sort of larger than life personality. It's a real asset. And I think that was the secret to Ann Richards' success. For, you know, for a for a yeah, for a, a woman Democrat to get elected, uh, even at the time, uh, the state was turning Republican. Mm -hmm. But people loved Ann because she was witty and uh, and she could stand up to the good old boys. Her best line? Oh, there are many of them, but one of my favorites, Molly Ivins was a, 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 a humorist and writer and uh, when uh, there was a manger scene in the Capitol and the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, filed suit because that was not constitutional to have a religious artifact inside the, inside the House of Representatives. And so um, Molly called the Governor Richards up and said, Annie, is it really necessary to take the manger out of the Capitol? And she said, I'm afraid so. And I, it's a shame because it's the only time we ever had three wise men in the Capitol. <laughs> <laughs> She's good. I think I said a moment ago, Tom Cruise. Of course, I meant Ted Cruz, yeah. the great Canadian yeah. who is now one of the senators from Texas. We'd like to return him to your... Uh, <laughs> you, it's okay. You can keep yeah. him. Uh, there's a saying that as California goes, so goes the nation. Texas and California are in deep competition to see which can be the most important state in the union. Do you think the expression suits Texas better now? Oh, yeah. You know, Texas is the future, and for good or ill. But, uh, you know, right now, te California is the largest state and the, maybe the bluest state. And, and Texas is the largest red state and the largest, second largest state. Um, but in California is number three. I mean, New York is number three. Mm -hmm. But uh, California has 55 electoral votes, which is how we elect our presidents. And, um, and Texas has 39. Well, California hasn't added to that since 2003. And in the next census, Texas will gain another four delegates as they did in the last time. So you're catching up. We're, we're expected to double in population. We have 29 million Texans now, double by the year 2050, at which time Texas will be almost as large as California and New York combined. So <laughs> it's not a idle boast to say that Texas is the future, but the decisions that we make in that state have national ramifications. Beyonce, Larry McMurtry, the Lonesome Dove, Richard Linklater, the director, Robert Rodriguez, there is something in the water in Texas that brings some awfully impressive cultural people to the fore. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that? What, is there something that nurtures talent in Texas differently from elsewhere? I think that there is a sense of uh, venture, you know, that people uh, feel uh, bold enough to try things, and not just the arts, but I, I, in the time that I've lived in Austin, I've seen how individual visions uh, can totally change the culture. Like um, Mike Levy started Texas Monthly, and, you know, unusual at the time to have a regional magazine like that. People like me came to Austin to write for it, and the literary scene that we now have there uh, was created uh, a young pre-med student, a freshman pre-med student at the University of Texas began to assemble computers in his dorm room, and his name was Michael Dell. Mm. And now the, you know, technology is a major uh, part of the economy in, in Austin, all because of that young freshman in the dorm room. Uh, Whole Foods started in Austin because a guy named John Mackey wanted to have an organic food store. Uh, you, know, the, you mentioned the filmmakers, people that decided to you know, stay in Austin and instead of immigrating to Nashville or to Hollywood or, or to New York in my case, you know, we decided to stay there. And that's the real question. You know, why? Uh, swim upstream like that, and I think is there's a kind of specific gravity about the culture that makes it hard to escape. You know, you really are a representative of good old-fashioned Southern gentility because I've now screwed up two names and you haven't corrected me either time. <laughs> uh, Tom Cruise for Ted Cruise, and I said Link Ladder instead of Link Later uh, for Richard, the film director. But anyway, thank you. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get it fixed eventually. Yeah. Having said that, it's also the home of Alex Jones, yeah. who was a notorious nutjob conspiracy theorist. Yeah. How is it that he still has so much currency to do his radio war show from Texas? 
I don't understand it. Uh, you know, he's under legal assault now. Uh, you know, some of the, for instance, you know, disparaging uh, some of the victims of the Sandy Hook killings, these school shootings, as being child actors. Um, this, he's never really held to account for the things that are totally wrong. Uh, for instance, he said there was a big military exercise a few years ago that spanned several states. And um, uh, Alex Jones said there was an attempt to take over the government, kind of a coup. It would keep Obama in office was one of the things. And they were going to be setting up uh, offices in the Target stores. And uh, this ice cream company, you know, was going to, you know, there would be mobile morgues and stuff like that. And he got people so alarmed, the governor called out the Texas National Guard to mo overview the totally crazy. crazy. And, and of course, nothing happened. And then no one ever holds Alex Jones to account. Uh, but his viewers, um, you know, he's he's adored by a lot of people, and uh, I, you know, the, the things that he's, the damage he's done, particularly from my point of view, since I've written a lot about 9/11 and terrorism, mm -hmm. and he's one of the fathers of this 9/11 truther movement yeah. that denies that uh, that you know Al Qaeda had anything to do with it, or that they express the idea that the U.S. government. Is a is a real culprit, and you know I can't tell you how upsetting it is having mm -hmm. spent so much time with victims of that tragedy to see it used for some sort of entertainment value. We well, should remind everybody; they probably know you're the guy who wrote the Looming Tower, so this is stuff you know a lot about. Yeah. Let's get back to this red state blue stuff. Um, I still need to understand better how a state that has three such big cities, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, San Antonio, yeah. and I guess Austin too to a certain extent. This, this number 11 in terms of, you know, it's the 11th largest city in Austin America. Austin is, yeah. so pretty soon in the top yeah. 10. How is this still a reliably red state with all that blue in it? I mean, you've got Hispanics, you've got um, you know, visible minorities. These are all the ingredients yeah. of a emerging blue state. Yeah, the, our population is very similar to California. We're both minority, majority minority states. We both have about 40% Hispanic uh, population. Uh, Hispanics vote in California, and they don't in Texas. Oh. And, uh, but if you take the question of ethnicity out of it and ask who does not vote in Texas, uh, it's the young, the poor, and the poorly educated. And we have a lot of them in Texas, and a lot of them are Hispanic. But, you know, there are... 29 million Texans, there are about 19 million of them who are registered to vote, but about half of them voted. So they took the trouble to register, but they did not take the trouble to actually vote. And when you look at it that way and ask what happened, my feeling is that they don't have the candidates that inspire them, and especially in the case of the Hispanics. You know, we have some attractive young Hispanic uh, political figures like uh, the Castro twins, the mm -hmm. former mayor of San Antonio and a congressman, but they haven't offered themselves for statewide office. Um, so, you know, until the uh, inspiring candidate comes along who can appeal to that constituency and motivate them enough to get to the polls, uh, Texas will stay where it is. But that happened. I, I mean, I remember when Wendy Davis, who was, who was young, she was attractive, she was principled, she, she was running statewide for the Democrats, she got killed. And she lost South Texas, where the Hispanic vote is, because of abortion. You know, she was a strong proponent of abortion, and, you know, there are a lot of Hispanics that are socially very conservative. Um, but Wendy did make the, uh, the observation that Texas is not a red state, it's a non-voting blue state. Hmm. And it, there's a lot of truth in that. Texas will turn blue. The, the demography is unquestioned. And I think sometimes the, the Republican Party in Texas has taken some kind of overdose of a hallucinogen that makes them think that they can antagonize Hispanic voters and the young and expect to be the future of Texas. When it turns blue, That'll mean California, Texas, and New York will be reliably blue states. Yeah. Does that mean Republicans will, I mean, for the foreseeable future, not win the presidency? That's right. For decades? It would be, 
it'd be a very difficult to imagine any kind of calculus in which uh, Republicans could take the White House. Let's talk sports for a second. I, uh, we want to thank you for the mention. Yeah, you know, thank you. Do you, you, you know what Blue I'm talking Jays? about? You mentioned the Blue Jays <laughs> in your book, a book about Texas. Your teams are called Cowboys and Rangers and Mavericks and Rockets and Oilers and Spurs. Right. No Blue Jays or Dolphins, you tell us, <laughs> yeah, that's right. in the state of Texas. Uh, why is this state so afraid to tap into its gentler side? Yeah, I, I try to do that some in the book because I write about the wildflowers and the birds and stuff like that because I'm a naturalist uh, or I love nature. A they lot. wouldn't have the flower on the license plate though. That would they? was that was I still think that was a horrible mistake. Uh, there was a movement to try to put wildflowers on the our license plates, which are, our license plates are very undistinguished, and. Um, there would, nothing could more favorably adorn the uh, license plate than blue bonnets and Indian hat and you know all these wonderful flowers that we have. But at the time, the Texas legislature moved on to the more important question of trying to make beef the official meat of the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> How did they do on that? Not so well. Not so well, okay. <laughs> Another thing I need to understand better is people are flocking to Houston, Texas in numbers like we can't imagine. Yeah. And this is a city that has had more flooding than any other city in America over the last four decades. Yeah. So why? Jobs. You know, uh, that's why they come to Texas at all. It's not for the scenery. Um, but, uh, you know, Texas is an immensely powerful job creator. And it's had, my father, you know, was an example of the transformation of Texas from blue to red. He was an Eisenhower Republican, being a returning, returning veteran from World War II. Ike is from Texas, right? Yeah, he was born in Denton, yeah. yeah. And uh, so there were a lot of, you know, people like my father that came into the state, uh, which was conservative, but, you know, Democrat, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and turned, turned the state toward the Republican column. Uh, now, all these people you're talking about having an interesting opposite effect because they're not all Republicans who are coming. You know, there are a lot of young people that are moving into the state and they, have, they bring different politics with them. Mm -hmm. And even the suburbs, it's interesting because, you know, the, the cities which have been blue and typically, you know, dominated by minorities and it, the suburbs have always been more like themselves than they are like the cities they surround. They are Anglo, white collar, uh, conservative entities. But you know now they're being populated by younger immigrants who don't share those uh, same qualities, and it's beginning to break up some of the the lock that the Republicans have had on the rural and suburban areas. You write in the book that somebody told you this place could become London or Lagos. Explain the reference. What do you mean? We were talking about education, and um, this is of all the issues in Texas that uh, alarm me, the education is, is at the top of my, my concern. Uh, Texas is 49th out of 50 states in how much it allocates to a student for his education. Thank God for Mississippi, eh? Uh, it, as it, long it, as they're it, number 50, you're not going to be. I think it's actually not Mississippi. It's not anymore? I, uh, Who no, is it now? I forgot. Maybe got to be Alabama number. or something. Yeah. But uh, I don't want to disparage Mississippi. <laughs> They've had enough dumped on them already. Okay. But, the, uh, but they, it, Texas is a pretty wealthy state. Mm -hmm. And um, yet the, the, the goal of the state government has been to diminish the tax burden. And, and they've done that. But of course, what the, the way they balance their budget is they subtract money from the schools, mm -hmm. which is you know, the, one of the biggest expenses that any state has. So in our recent Nash Nations Report card, um, Texas came out at 41st 40 first in the fourth grade and 45th, 48th in the eighth grade. And th what's so alarming about it is that 10% of all the school children in America are Texans. So it's not just the state we're hurting, the whole country is being damaged by the fact that we're not educating our children. And, and there was an attempt in the recent legislative session to put a break on the rise of property taxes, which is how we pay for our schools to compensate for the absence of a state contribution. So they're essentially throttling uh, the public education. There was even an attempt to take money out of our diminished public education supply and put it into private schools. And, 
hey, you know, I don't know why they're doing this, but if, if it were racism, it would look a lot like this. You know, that they were unwilling to support the education of black and brown people in Texas. A couple of minutes to go, I want to touch on a few more things. How much do you love your guns in Texas? You know, this is a mixed thing about guns. I think Texans get a, you know, a more uh, bad press about guns than they merit because lots of states have the same guns or even more uh, open gun, like Vermont. Anybody can pick up a gun as long as you're over, I think, 16, but you don't even need a license. And nobody criticizes Vermont, but, um, but Texas has an unfortunate history with guns, not just the Kennedy assassination. The, uh, the whole school shooting thing began in Austin. Uh, I think it was 1966 when Charles Whitman climbed up the tower uh, on the University of Texas campus uh, with an arsenal. And, um, and back then there were no SWAT teams, there was not even a university police force. And uh, he started uh, firing his, uh, his weapon. Uh, the first person he shot was a classmate of mine in high school, uh, Claire James, who was nine months pregnant and uh, he killed her baby. Uh, Claire survived, but the, 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 the social meme of school shooting really began uh, that day in Austin. And, um, you know, recently we had a big killing in a church uh, in, near Austin, Sunderland Springs. And so what was the response of our political leaders? Uh, the attorney general said we should arm the parishioners. What do you think of that idea? It's nuts. But it's also, we're living in a world that the NRA has really made for us now. It is true that, you know, there's a tremendous number of guns in America. And, uh, and it's going to be very difficult to call them back. So what do you do? How do you treat uh, a heavily armed culture? I, I remember a friend and I were in the George Bush Museum in, uh, in Dallas, recently opened. And we were standing with our family and uh, we're in this big marble atrium and someone called out active shooter. And we all did the totally wrong thing. We just hit the deck, uh, you know, perfect captives. You know, and then an elderly man I saw fall down and his head bounced on the marble. And, and uh, as I was lying there, I thought, wait a minute, you're an investigative reporter, you know, so I got up, went over and there were now school uh, uh, guards with automatic weapons and uh, another guard creeping around with his uh, unholstered pistol and what's going on? And it turned out it was a black child who had been playing with a toy gun out in the front yard. And I had seen him come in, he was going to the restroom, but he left his toy gun with his father, and like all toy guns in America now, they have a little orange tip so that you know that it's not a real weapon. But suddenly there was a black man with a gun, and the, the cops put him on the ground and handcuffed him and you know, interrogated him for a couple of hours knowing that it was a toy gun. But it shows you that even in Texas, there's a lot of apprehension about seeing weapons. And um, during that police shooting, Dozens of people, you know, in the Black Lives Matter march showed up carrying long guns. And, uh, and the police didn't know who was doing the shooting. And the, and the people in the crowd didn't know who was shooting. But they were protesting police violence. So who would they shoot? Mm. Uh, it was amazing that there were not more people killed in a melee. So maybe the Norwegians are right. Der war help Texas, right? What does that mean? <laughs> it means it was totally bonkers. <laughs> Texas in Norwegian means bonkers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed the book. It was such a great read. God Save Texas, A Journey into the Soul of the Lone Star State. Lawrence Wright, great to have you here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. It was a huge pleasure, Steve. Thanks for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.